It's always a pleasure to welcome Dr. and former Professor Raghu Ramakrishnan uh, of Microsoft to uh, Berkeley again. Um, Raghu is like the chief of data. I can't remember the exact title. CTO for data. Is that, did I get that right? He's a big honcho with data at Microsoft. Um, and Raghu's had a storied career um, going back to the, well, I won't say how long, um, but um, he was a leader in academia for decades uh, and was one of my teachers when I was a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin. Um, his students have gone on to fame and fortune. Raghu himself went off um, to do many different things, including startups, as well as he was one of the leaders of Yahoo Labs in its glory days when they were really pumping out top-notch research. Um, and um, he built that org, uh, a remarkable run there. Um, and has been at Microsoft for quite some time now on the product side, um, you know, so he knows academia, startups, research labs, and corporate America or corporate international really um, just brings a huge breadth of perspective um, and he can go deep and he can go broad. So we're really, really pleased to have him telling us what's coming next um, from Microsoft. Take it away, Raghu. Thanks, Joe. And speaking of students, you know, um, that's a single thing I'm most proud of. And these days, I like to say, my graduate students, their average net worth is well north of $100 million a piece. And this is true, actually, because the founders of Pinduoduo were both former students. <laughs> so right there, they take care of everyone else, which also highlights the flaws of taking averages too seriously. Uh, that said, it's a pleasure to be uh, back at Berkeley and let's get going without further ado. So the, the talk has three parts. The first part, I wanna give you a sense of how you know, I see the world trending, the world of databases, of course, uh, and then dive a little deeper into one facet of what we have done here, uh, which is scale out uh, SQL query processing that's cloud native. There's actually a VLDB paper this year uh, and my co-author and the lead architect of the system, uh, Hazep Aguiar is on the call. He'll be monitoring the chat window in addition. The third part, I wanna talk about governance, which is Something I'll touch on in the overview, something I won't have time to go into in great detail, but something that I would like to nonetheless uh, connect the dots on for you. Okay, let's begin with the overview. Look, this is a slide that captures all the different services we offer at Microsoft in Azure. And there's one broad point I wanna make uh, there's a lot of services here. And feedback we get consistently is people are overwhelmed, right? And this is really part of what we have seen happening over the past, over the past many years. There used to be a time when databases meant your favorite RDBMS. And you went there if you wanted to do transactional modifications to data sets. Uh, if you wanted to do queries, or if you wanted to secure, govern your data. You could use role-based access control, you could do scans, you could do audits, you could even have integrity constraints uh, that say, you know, protected you from making unintended changes. All of that was part and parcel of why you paid the big bucks for a DBMS. Then as data became more and more central, uh, and the types of data, the scale of data, everything grew. You saw this big burst of innovation. Things like Hadoop, Spark, all of these big data ecosystems, the incredible growth of machine learning uh, led to a plethora of tools. And likewise, on the operational side, relational systems, NoSQL systems, geo-replication, led to a plethora of systems. And that's what you see on the screen in front of you. I'm now seeing fatigue and your typical enterprise is not staffed 
entirely with Berkeley students, unfortunately, or with Wisconsin students, right? Uh, and dealing with this complex landscape is not easy, especially since the regulatory landscape has gotten much tighter. How many of you have heard of GDPR or CCPA? And the whole host of regulations that go to, uh, you know, that are similar. If you haven't, count yourself lucky. Uh, if you have, I feel for you, uh, especially if you have been in the position of getting your company or your organization compliant with these regulations. And these regulations are good. As data is used, we have an obligation, I think, to make sure it's used responsibly. But meeting those kinds of concerns gets impossibly hard when your data is spread over so many different services, so many different locations on-prem, multiple clouds. And so something has to give. And at the heart of a lot of this, it's this thing called digital transformation. Company after company is trying to bring together all the data they can. Uh, you know, Tesla, for example, looks at data uh, from their cars to deal with issues that they can handle proactively before they become a huge crisis. So, Turned out their uh, auto cruise control, whatever they call it, wasn't working so great on curves. And they got this you know, through a few complaints in their customer forums, but also by looking at the telemetry of what cars were doing as they went on curves, how brakes were being pumped and so on. And using these, they were able to address the issue, became it became an issue, right? This is an example of a digital feedback loop. Anything you can observe, you can learn from and fix, right? And that virtuous cycle is becoming transformative. And at the heart of it is gathering all the information you can so you have a good view of uh, what you're concerned about uh, from every perspective. Then analyze that, build your models, do whatever it takes, and once you become smarter, figure out how you can actually intervene and make things better. So let's start with analytics. Going from this complex picture, oh, sorry, this is where, bear with me. So in this complex picture, if you take HD Insight, I've just used the Microsoft logos. It's Hadoop, Big Data, Spark. If you take data warehouses, those are your classic relational uh, data warehousing. Data movement is a part of any kind of aggregation. So I included Data Factory, which is similar to Informatica, Synapse, I mean, uh, uh, Talent and things like this. We took these three, took the best elements of them and combined them into a service that we call uh, Synapse Analytics. That's an example of a converged system to introduce the terminology, a single sign-on in which you can do things that previously you would have logged into multiple services for. And over time, we'll add more and more capabilities in there so that our world vision is you can do any kind of analytics using state-of-the-art capabilities, but with more simplicity by logging into a single service being able to look at all your data and do what you need to using the right tools. But that still leaves the challenge of data in your operational stores. That still leaves the challenge of how do you govern the whole, right? And we'll talk about all this going forward. The backdrop to this, the cloud has been the single biggest uh, thing in even my long uh, span as a database researcher. Fundamentally, it gives you this amazing property of elastic allocation of resources, more compute, more storage, or less of either almost instantaneously. 
the flip side is your memory hierarchy just got much wider, right? Uh, your storage, at least your cheap remote storage is remote. And part of the challenge you're gonna face, especially for data intensive workloads, how to bridge that. And when you think of data workloads, they're not one size fits all. While someone may tell you, hey, I can give you an HTAP system in which you can keep all your data, do your OLTP workloads, do your analytic workloads. Really what they are saying is, as long as you're willing to provision enough memory and resources to cover the convex hull of both workloads, right? Uh, while that's theoretically feasible, it's also expensive. And for true tier one workloads, it's frankly not feasible. So the most common pattern is people use custom systems for analytics and for operations. And so when you're talking about cloud native architectures, they mean different things based on the workload you're trying to handle. Let's take a slightly closer look at this. Across the board, whether you're talking about relational OLTP systems, NoSQL systems, data lakes, warehouses, we are seeing this trend to cloud native architectures. And keep in mind, that's not such an obvious thing. If you look at Redshift, if you look at SQL DW, they took architectures designed for on-prem deployment and essentially hoisted them into the cloud by renting VMs, adding monitoring and saying, voila, cloud service, right? But those architectures, were designed to do really well in a stable, high-performance environment. Teradata, Exadata, the systems I mentioned, they all fit into that category. In the cloud, the price you pay for elasticity is things fail. You have a bazillion components that you stitch together. And these are commodity components, right? Failure is a fact of life. So, you need to rethink your architectures from the ground up. And the initial services didn't do that. But as the cloud became more and more broadly adopted, the cost of doing business without custom architectures was too high. And so all of us, all the major cloud vendors, we are moving in this direction, right? If you take relational OLTP, Aurora from AWS, uh, SQL Hyperscale from us, uh, or Spana, they're all examples. NoSQL, DynamoDB, Cosmos DB, these are examples. If you take big data or the lake where updates were not a big issue, frankly, Hadoop, MapReduce, from the ground up, they separated compute and state. They were intrinsically uh, cloud friendly. Data warehouses, Snowflake, what we are doing with Polaris, BigQuery, these are examples of cloud native architectures. And across all of them, what runs in the compute, in the VMs or containers, right, is essentially stateless. While there's data in there, it's a cache, and the loss of it cannot be catastrophic. The source of truth is elsewhere. And that elsewhere, you can't simply say it's in cloud storage. Much of it is. But if you want good performance, you will have to think through the caching hierarchy, right? And how to make things robust to failure. And the details of how you do that, that's the rest of the story, right? And if you think about how that works in the context of an OLTP environment, this is the architecture the Socrates paper described for SQL hyperscale, right? Uh, and I'll just point out a few things. I won't go through this in detail. What you see up here, the primary and the scale out read secondaries, they are the VMs in which instances of SQL Server run, calculate queries, I mean, compute queries, do your transactions and the like. Underneath though, there is a right ahead log and that's a custom log service, right? Running in Azure. And leveraging that, there's actually a collection of page servers running in compute right? The data is split across them. And when you don't get a hit in the actual machine, including its extended 
cache, then you, you can fall to one of the paid servers rather than go all the way to storage, okay? And where do you do all these complicated things? Otherwise, you'll never get the performance you need and the performance you can get on-prem with everything running on bespoke hardware, okay? That's what it takes to have a cloud-native service, a cloud-native OLTP service to which you can lift and ship existing SQL workloads from your largest on-prem customers. And this took several years to mature, right? But the benefits are transformative. First and foremost, a number of things that you want in the cloud, elastic provisioning, scaling up, scaling down. Yeah, this architecture will give it to you. The older uh, lift and shift, uh, an existing non-native architecture will not let you take advantage of elasticity. But some things that perhaps are not so obvious. Forever and a day, we have struggled with things like recovery, right? If you have a 100 terabyte database and someone pours Coke on one of the disks, it's going to take a while to put Humpty Dumpty together again. I mean, that's just how it is. On the other hand, all of the work we are doing here towards intelligent caching, having redundant copies in order to bridge the latency hierarchies in the cloud, turns out you can build on them to deliver constant time recovery uh, independent of uh, independent, excuse me, of data size. And in general, that holds for most size of data operations, right? And that's a huge side benefit. Likewise, your read replicas can be configured with incredible flexibility, right? All of this, I won't go into in detail. If you're interested, please go read the Socrates paper. Oh, I wish I had put a, a reference in here. It's a Sigmod paper from a couple of years ago. Or if you want to get a different take on similar concepts, go read the Aurora paper from the AWS guys. These are the two that I would point to as really good uh, starting points. Cosmos DB. You know, if you look at DynamoDB, it's a key value store that has grown to have more and more capabilities. If you look at the peanuts work we did at Yahoo, that's another example of a geo-replicated uh, essentially key value store. Uh, and once you have geo replication, you have to give uh, some thought to the types of consistency you want to support across replicas. So all these systems provide multiple notions of consistency that you as an app developer can, can choose from. In the case of Cosmos DB, underneath, there is a model that's really JSON documents, but that's skinned with many data models. Ultimately, uh, it supports Mongo APIs, Cassandra APIs, and the like, right? And it offers actual SLAs for most kinds of operations. In my opinion, it is the best architected of this family of uh, systems, including peanuts. And if you're interested, again, I would recommend that you go read uh, the relevant papers, but that's another example of a cloud native architecture. Let's turn to analytics now which is going to be the focus of this talk. When I came to Microsoft, uh, and I thought, I work with Hadoop uh, at Yahoo. I know big data. We had clusters, 4,000, 5,000 nodes, which were among the biggest anywhere. The day I walked in, I realized there was an internal lake where the smallest cluster was around 11,000 nodes. And the total amount of data in the system was 1.4 exabytes. And I can tell you that it cut me down to size very quickly, right? It was humbling. And people were using it. This was in 2012. People were using it for all kinds of things across the company, right? Batch, interactive, streaming, machine learning, as you can imagine, many analytic tools. We learned a lesson where the tools could pick up the output of each other. It was fluid, okay? But one example where, the, where this was glaringly absent, the tools there did not include a standard T-SQL head. And if you wanted to use Power BI, Tableau kind of tools, you need a T-SQL interface. You need a standard SQL interface. And so you needed to take the output of jobs like scope and spark 
and load them into a DW warehouse, right? A SQL warehouse. And if you're going to take multiple terabytes and load them every day, you can go to Columbia to pick your coffee beans and you aren't going to be too happy, right? This we learned quickly was something we needed to fix. And the scales at which we fixed them. So 2012, the vertical column here is the volume of data. Uh, by 2016, it was well north of 10 exabytes. The daily IO was two or three exabytes. The daily volume of telemetry logs was double digit petabytes, right? And the number of people using this, thousands of developers from across hundreds of teams, right? And our smallest cluster in 2016, I haven't tracked it since, was about 43,000 nodes. So at these scales, uh, the challenges were immense. And across all of this, as we started to build the next of the software, we had an imperative coming all the way from Satya. Whatever we built for our internal usage, we also needed to be able to offer to our external uh, users. And the best of external uh, tools we needed to bring, make available to our internal uh, customers. In other words, 1P equals 3P. First party customers must be on par with third party customers. And that's how we built the underlying file system, right? Which was a GFS-like file system. We rebuilt in a way that was essentially Hadoop compatible. Uh, but we had to architect it from the ground up because Hadoop simply would not scale to these levels. That's what you might be familiar with as Azure Data Lake Store. It's an Azure service. And all of the 10 plus exabytes I'm talking about have already been migrated to ADLS. As far as the analytics is concerned, we are currently migrating it to Synapse, which I will tell you about. And Synapse, this example of a converged data platform I'm about to tell you more about. Again, it has been designed, engineered to be capable of taking on these kinds of scales, right? Because that was our design requirement. To put this in perspective, this actually is a picture that, you know, builds on numbers from Gartner uh, from a couple of years ago. So if anything, the numbers are higher right now. If you take relational OLTP, Azure SQL DB is an example of that, right? Aurora would be another example of that. Cosmos DB, Dynamo DB, these would be examples of NoSQL OLTP, and they happen to be georeplicated. If you take analytics, you have the classic relational warehouses, Azure SQL DW and Redshift would be examples. And if you take data lakes or big data, Spark, Hive, uh, HD Insight, Databricks, Synapse. Uh, Synapse actually spans a bit more, I'll come to this. They would all be examples here. What we see happening to this picture is the following. Analytics is converging. There's gonna be a family of systems where with a single sign-on, you can do things that previously you needed a Hadoop system or a Spark system as well as a DW, as well as a Splunk, and so on and so forth. Those capabilities are not going anywhere. People need them, right? But the way they are packaged, the way they come together, the way they are architected under the hood will all change. The kind of convergence I'm talking about cannot be achieved by simply UX uh, glue. Underneath, the systems will need to be ripped apart and reconfigured in a more modular way. And that, by the way, is one of the nice things about the timing here. The, the cloud is forcing us to rip things apart and rebuild them anyway, in order to be cloud native. And we are trying to take advantage of that to also build in modular ways. So when we put Humpty Dumpty together again, we can build truly converged systems, right? There are some synergy in the timing as it happens. If you do this, okay, analytics life becomes simpler. But as I've said earlier, on the operational side, it's still quite separate, right? In fact, 
relational OLTP, the underlying way you represent data, the way you do things will not be the same as what happens for these NoSQL OLTP systems. So what happens when people want to do operational analytics? You need to make it easy to get at the data there for your analytics as part of your larger extended aggregation of data. We'll talk about that. And lastly, governance. It's not going to be siloed. If you notice in the earlier picture, every DBMS, be it SQL DB or Cosmos DB or Hadoop, Hadoop has Ranger, uh, they each had their own governance capabilities. They were self-contained in this regard. Going forward, just like operational databases and analytic databases are market segments, governance is going to be a new market segment that cuts across the whole. You're going to have a single pane of glass to govern your entire data estate. Nothing quite meets that bar today, but we are getting there. So let's start with converged analytics. That's part one of the talk, the overview, the beliefs that inform how we are proceeding. And now let's talk about some of the technical aspects of uh, converging analytics. Here's a simplified picture of what's in Synapse. There's a studio experience, a generalization of SQL studio. Uh, we also support notebooks. So there are many different experiences, IDEs. Yeah, they're there. And if you look at uh, what happens when you log in, you're in an artifact called a workspace, which is simply uh, the boundary for you know, VNets and things like that, security monitoring. Uh, it's a unit of management. But NetNet, once you're in a workspace, you have access to a SQL endpoint, to a Spark endpoint, to, you know, easy ways to create and monitor pipelines of tasks, right? That's what there is today. But let's dig a little deeper to see what that means. What does it mean to say you have SQL and Spark integrated? Basically, you can use Spark, either Synapse Spark or Databricks in the case of Azure, uh, do some analysis, write the results out to ADLS uh, in whatever Parquet form, and when you do that, the high Metastore catalog uh, is something that the Synapse engines all understand natively. So in, in Synapse, SQL comes in two form factors, a serverless form factor, and one where you can create a pool, a provision form factor. And with a serverless form factor in this example, you can directly issue a query against the files you just wrote. No, so, no notion of a separate import, right? And to do this, we had to change up the underlying implementation to recognize all these myriad file formats, uh, to get stats on all of them, uh, to understand metadata in the form of things like uh, the Hive Meta Server, Meta Store. Uh, but being able to do that allows you to have this kind of interop. On the same underlying data, the output of SQL can be consumed by Spark, the output of Spark can be consumed by SQL, you know, knock yourself out. And furthermore, similar integrations with Power BI. You can go all the way from raw data uh, to a Power BI dashboard pretty easily. Well, that's one part of the story. Earlier, SQL has already this notion of an external table. So if you wanted to query an external table, you could. And the performance, the, what I'm showing you here are the 22 TPCH queries, one terabyte. The black bars are the old numbers. The blue bars, are the numbers with the new cloud native uh, serverless SQL using the Polaris engine, right? So we also did the work to fundamentally change the implementation to uh, do well. One more thing, keep in mind that our bar is to meet our internal workloads, right? And also we wanted to kind of show off a little bit. So we actually undertook to do a one petabyte TPCH run, all 22 queries. The largest prior scale I've heard about, at some point there was a 100 terabyte number. It's no longer there. Uh, the largest current is about 30 terabytes, right? And we set ourselves this goal because this is a good way to keep ourselves honest, right? You have to deal with fundamental things like partial restart. 
auto scaling if you have to have any hope of doing this in a cloud setting. And I'll tell you more about exactly what went into that uh, a bit later in this talk, all right? All right, what about operational data? How does that fit in here? Let's take a concrete example. If you have data in Azure Cosmos DB, the data is stored in ways that optimize for the Cosmos DB workloads. And if you now want to do analytics, uh, you typically do ETL. You could do ETL using Synapse pipelines, uh, or you could have a third-party Informatica uh, pipeline. But net-net, managing pipelines is painful, however you look at it. But there's a very, very common pattern. So we added a feature called Synapse Link, right? You can point to some data sets in Cosmos DB and say, I also want these to be available for analytics. Think of it as saying, I have this employee table and I want to do range queries on salary. What happens? You build a B3 index underneath, right? And when you build a B3 index, the system takes responsibility for maintaining that index. The user essentially gives you a clue as to what workloads they care about. That's really what's going on here. When you point to something and say, I want this to be available for analytics in one system, the operational system, underneath end-to-end, -end, we incrementally maintain uh, analytics optimized columnar version of the relevant data. Think of it as an index in Synapse of data in a source, okay? And ultimately in the cloud, the row store version of data and the column store version of data from these two different services may well be on the same rack for all we know, right? So the cloud again uh, makes it easy to do these kinds of things. Okay, but that's what I just described to you is one instance of a broader philosophy. Throughout we're built on open APIs, Atlas, uh, HDFS, uh, across the board, we have used standard components. The idea being, we want to encourage this kind of connectivity, deeper integration, even with respect to external systems that we Microsoft don't necessarily own or control. In particular, data governance, the whole power ecosystem, Power BI and the rest, machine learning, Azure machine learning, uh, MLflow, uh, Spark ML, all of these, we integrate deeply with Synapse in similar ways, although I won't get into those details today. What I'm gonna do next is go deeper into the scale out distributed query processing uh, in the Polaris engine. This is what is behind the petabyte uh, benchmark uh, and the numbers I showed you earlier. Here's the paper. There's a number of people who actually did the work. Uh, so I wanna give credit to all of them. Let's start. Underneath, Polaris views data through an abstraction called a cell. A cell is some collection of columnar shards, okay? And these, by default, we hash them. So they get squished very broadly horizontally. So your computations will always be highly parallelizable. Additionally, if we have some idea of the kind of queries to expect, there can, they can be a user-influenced uh, composite key and we can also organize partitions through this secondary approach. Net-net, whether the data is in a transactionally managed Synapse store, whether it's in files in the lake uh, created by other systems, or whether it is operational data that's available to us, we essentially map them in terms of cells and operate on them using the cell as a, as a normative abstraction. This idealized picture, the way to interpret it, each circle is a container. It could be a k container, it could be a VM, whatever. The half moon in there, the blue half moon, that's cached data. As I said earlier, without caching, you will not have the performance you want in the cloud. But the point here, the cache data, if it's lost, if the node is lost, that's okay. We know 
what that was and the underlying source of truth is available to us. There's a clean separation. That's the data versus compute separation. But at the same time, the biggest challenge is transactional updates, right? And we have carefully centralized just enough that we can have that state be durable. By the way, the backend here uses uh, SQL DB, which I talked about earlier, uh, to provide a highly available uh, management of this state, the metadata, the catalog information, and the transactional in-flight metadata. And by the way, before you ask, it is not even close to being a centralization bottleneck. The upshot of this though is, right? While we can handle all the data sources we talked about, this is the second part of the story. The centralization, the, the, the decoupling of the state versus the computer. And the net net is, we can now focus on delivering high performance concurrency workload management on these, on what goes on here without worrying over much about failure, okay? If anything here fails, the relevant data can be rehydrated. The relevant transactional information is here. The only thing that remains, what exactly happens to a query? Using all of this, how can I now translate my query into an actual execution that takes advantage of all of these nice things I talked to you about? Let's jump into that. So the underlying data, as I said, is organized as cells. The query itself, the first thing we do is use SQL Server and the 20 years of investment we have made in it to produce a plan. This is the standard memo. This comes from the Cascades Optimizer, uh, which again, uh, there are papers going back many years. Then we make another pass annotated to make some changes, taking into account the distributed uh, nature of our data and the environment, that's a distributed plan. And just like any SQL plan, it's a DAG of operators. And if you take the operators, any given node turns into a template for tasks, okay? Let's look at this a bit more closely. In this task template, I'm taking an operator node which is a join of P and Q. P and Q have both been sharded. So the join of P and Q really can be decomposed into a collection of tasks, PI join QI. And if you take that, those tasks, those are the actual executable units. Each task has the necessary code to carry out the join. And it's self-describing in that it knows what cells are needed for that task, right? So if I had to summarize everything I've told you so far, a query is turned into a collection of tasks. And these tasks, there are some dependencies among them, obviously, reflecting the query tree. And as long as you complete all tasks while respecting the dependencies, you have a successful execution, okay? Let's look at the implications of that. I now have four nodes and I am trying to execute this uh, query with 16 tasks. I've divided them evenly. Life is rarely this perfect, but you aim to balance. And if everything completes successfully, all is good. The most common case, right? But let's say something happens. One of your nodes fails. Previously, I gave it the three-fingered salute. Control Alt Del, restart. Now you simply reassign the tasks on that failed node to the surviving nodes. So first off, it improves your SLAs for any job. Second, when you're trying to do very large scale queries, you know, in our internal lake, we often run queries that span thousands of nodes. This is production jobs. Any large job, tens of nodes will fail. And when they fail, you need to be able to recover with partial restart. You can't hit restart and start all over again. So 
all of the work we have done to make this cloud native allows you to do this. Suppose there's a hotspot, you can move stuff around, right? If that hotspot uh, actually persists, then it's an indication you need to add more resources and you can do that incrementally, right? These are the advantages of a cloud native architecture, right? And ultimately, uh, you can also use this to add as many nodes as you need to do a petabyte TPCH or more, if that's what you want to do. So I'll skip through these animations. There is a broader point I want to make. With this, the combination of partial restart and auto scale means you can go to as high a workload as you want. The main question will be performance, interactivity. And to get to the right levels of performance, what I've told you is only part of the story. The most important part I'm not telling you is the details of how you make your cache work. Anytime these tasks move across nodes, understand that there's some data shipping that comes with a price. So these are things you wanna be careful about. The cache hierarchy is not likely to be solely intra node. You know, here I've shown nodes and then there's the remote cloud storage you're probably going to need a bit more sophistication than that in your memory hierarchy, in your caching hierarchy. Those details I'll skip over for now. But there's something else I do also want to point out. One of the things that systems like Snowflake support is multiple pools that can talk to the same logical database, right? Now, given the fact that we have centralized, we have decoupled the transaction state as well as the metadata state from the actual pool in which a computation executes, this falls out as a byproduct, right? And in all of this, keep in mind something that does not change. While I can submit a query from multiple pools, a query only runs if I, the requester, have the appropriate apples. And those are set you know, in SQL using grant reward statements the same as always. And this where also there is going to be this intersection between analytics and the evolving world of governance, which I'll talk about in the last segment of this talk, okay? Before I go there, I want to get a little deeper into how a query is orchestrated. So if you take a query, on the one hand, what we are doing is simply converting it into this large task DAG. And when you look at papers like Dryad, right, we are borrowing those ideas and building on them, right? But along the way, we have also pushed the envelope in a couple of ways that I'd like to call out for you. First, our underlying DAGs are across all the queries in flight, not per query. The entire workload, anything that's executing is there and you can share some of the computation across queries. Second, the scheduling, the orchestration, everything is across the workload. And to do the orchestration, the tracking, we have extended a notion of hierarchical state machines, right? That maintains, that monitors the in-flight state of a an execution in very fine green, very economically. And I'll try and sort of show you an animation that illustrates that. The query when it starts, you know, there is a node for the query as a whole. And any of these nodes can be in one of multiple states. It's running, it's blocked, right? And there are states that say ready, failed and success, right? There are composite and simple states. When you start the query, it's a composite state that's ready to run. And what you do here is you, based on the query DAG, you spin up new nodes corresponding to the tasks that are children of the root, right? And here, when I spun up this task, right, it was blocked because it immediately spun up task templates for two of its subtasks. So here's a query tree where the root has two children, right? And let's look at each of these. 
these are going to actually ground out in this example into atomic tasks. This could be a join, right? The earlier example I gave you of PI join QI, uh, those would be the kind of tasks we are talking about. This is the node for P join Q as an example. And this is where the bulk of the work happens. At any given time, there could be a bazillion of these leaf level tasks, right? But each of them, you know the connection to the, the query node that spot that generated it, uh, the state of the whole computation. And let's say there's a failure of a task. How do we surgically restart? Well, that particular thing, you know it failed, you can try running it. Uh, if it's, if the node didn't fail, if it was simply some transient failure, it'll succeed. If the node is kaput, you may have to migrate this task, reassign it to another physical node, run it, but then eventually, hopefully it succeeds. And when that's complete, when both the children are complete, then you go back to the top level. Okay, you, you, you get the idea, I hope. Net net, these are ideas where at the end of the day, the hard part, the really hard part was to bring together a really mature complex query evaluation ecosystem in SQL Server to choose the bits that we wanted to continue to leverage. Everything that, ha that happens in a single physical node, everything involved in query optimization, we wanted to build on. At the same time, everything that spanned distributed execution, including the aspects of distributed query optimization, we built from the ground up, right? And in doing so, we borrowed from lots of ideas from the big data literature, right? And extended them and synthesized them. It was as much a matter of engineering taste as engineering innovation to get this right. And I encourage you to read the paper for more details. Pausing here for a moment. Uh, one of the things that as an academic, uh, I never fully appreciated. It's one thing to design a complex algorithm and implement it. But when you think about what it takes to actually deliver it in a production system, especially if your goal is not to build a net new company that starts from scratch, but to innovate in an existing code base such as SQL Server, I simply did not appreciate, to be honest, the level of complexity in dealing with millions of lines of code written by generations who have long since moved on to houses on the lake, okay? This is an immense challenge. And let me also say as a reviewer of academic papers, the common refrain of, it seems fine, but I don't see depth, which is a code word for, there aren't deep theorems, the algorithms are, aren't terribly complex. I find that as a systems person, very frustrating. If your algorithm is complicated, trust me, chances are it won't see the light of day. Not unless you really, really simplify how it can be injected into a much more complex context. Simplicity wins and wins twice on Sundays. So this is my two cents in speaking to my academic roots. Please, please learn to appreciate simplicity. Okay, governance. Uh, Raghav, sorry, give me, I just wanna interrupt you for just a second. Um, yes. We have just a few more minutes before the hour. Obviously we can stay longer, um, but for people who do need to leave at one, I just wanna let everyone, remind everyone that if you'd like to, um, continue a conversation with Raghu um, in the announcement email. I gave a link to uh, his administrative assistant who will be setting up um, like follow-up appointments, either one-on-one -on -one or small groups, however you wanna do it. So this is just a reminder for everyone who needs to leave in a few minutes. But um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. So please continue. Thanks, Matthew. So if you look at how we are approaching governance, frankly, 
we went through hell in becoming compliant with GDPR. For three years, right, we took waves of uh, iterations to get to a place where we were compliant. And partly it was because we didn't have the governance infrastructure we needed. We had to roll it from scratch. And given our 1P, 3P uh, philosophy, we are now in the process of externalizing that infrastructure. It's been running in production since May um, 2018, but getting it ready for external consumption is a different story. So underneath, the first thing we do is to build an infrastructure to automatically scan every data repository you have, okay? Inside Microsoft, in addition to our giant lake, there are hundreds of instances of SQL Server, Data Explorer, various other systems. We scan all of them, pull out the metadata describing the contents. What do I mean by metadata? Name, rank, and serial number, the schema, who built it, uh, the owner, the rights associated with it, classification, sensitivity, is this personally identifiable lineage? How was this data created? I brought this in from here. I copied it from there with this transformation. I ran this Spark query. I ran the SQL query, joined these two data sets, produced that. We track all of this. All of that, it's metadata describing the entirety of your data estate. That is the data map, okay? And in doing this, we are also aligning with labels from the office ecosystem in Microsoft because that's part of what we need to do. What is there today is this data map and various capabilities for data discovery. You can define glossaries, search in terms of glossaries. You can look at all the data you have. And by the way, that's a bigger value proposition than you'd realize. As part of our journey, we discovered tens of terabytes of data with no owner that we had faithfully been refreshing for years with no one running a single query against it. And this is a fairly sophisticated organization, mind you, okay? Uh, then various capabilities for sharing this data. But what I'm about to briefly touch on for you is the next wave of what we are working on, which is various policies for expressing and enforcing policies, not against one database, but against your entire estate, okay? And as I said, everything we are doing, we are following the same playbook we used for our internal work. And the numbers there are staggering, frankly. Okay. On governance, if there's nothing else you take away, take away this one thing. Traditional access control in a database is giving way to a much broader paradigm of data use governance. Access control itself, even within the purview of a single database, People want fine-grained access control. People want all kinds of things you wouldn't believe. But much more materially, they want this not just across one database, but across the whole, the whole estate. That's not easy. They don't just want access control. They want data loss prevention. They want to be able to say things like, this data cannot be exfiltrated beyond this geographic boundary, beyond this VPN, uh, all kinds of notions of exfiltration. They want to be able to control life cycle. This must be kept for at least a month. It, it cannot be kept for more than six months, okay? The nature of what people want to do with their data is just changing beyond belief. And what we are working on now is creating a central pane of glass for authoring all these attribute-based access control mechanisms, workflow communication and so on, classification, cataloging, uh, all of this is centralized, one pane of glass where you can see the whole, where you can set your policies, where you can audit them, monitor, right? The enforcement has to be close to the data. You have to work with existing systems, right? So that is that combination going on. And the result of it is hopefully gonna be a simpler experience for someone tasked with governing the data. One example before we close. So let's say I have, several SQL Server instances, each of which allows you to use your familiar grant revoke regime to express permissions. Then there are files, because after all, this is the broader ecosystem of lakes and warehouses. And now you want to say something like, Alice cannot access personally identifiable information, or perhaps more realistically, if you want to access PII information, you need to be logged in with two-factor authentication. 
that must be over and above any permissions you enjoy given to you by the owner of the data. So if I own the employee table and I give Joe the right to read it, he still cannot read it if he's not logged in with two-factor authentication. And you need to enforce that. And not just in the database, they should hold for any file in ADLS, right? This is the world where this notion of where it applies, even that is dynamic. I scan data and detect that it is PII and automatically a rule kicks into effect, right? And it's not just tagging based on labels. It might be if some data is sensitive, any data derived from sensitive data must be handled a certain way. So the whole world of governance is turning into increasingly dynamic assertions of control, okay? And bottom line, this is not about any one repository. It is about the entire estate. That is the fundamentally challenging thing that's transpiring uh, with uh, data governance. This next slide, if you, if you take even SQL Server, beyond the standard grant privileges, the granularity, people want to control role level, cell level access, and they want to control that based on data in other tables. So if there is a table that defines functional responsibilities, I'll need to do a join with that to pick up what rights someone has to data in another table and enforce it at the cell level right? Way beyond looking at the shape of a table and saying, I grant you access to this column of the state, right? So life in this space is changing at a rapid, rapid clip. None of us, Microsoft included, is quite there, but I think there's an enormous opportunity for us to innovate together here. And when you think about the, how deeply the tentacles of governance extend into the data and the database uh, management, it composes more deeply than you would realize with my earlier presentations of how an analytics is converging, how operational and analytic data, uh, analytic data need to be thought of together. Uh, so too is governance something deeply interleaved with all of the above, okay? So thank you all. Uh, now if you have questions, I'm happy to try and answer a couple, but feel free as Matt said, uh, to reach out and grab some time with me. Unfortunately, today was a horrible day, uh, but I would love to connect with you and anyone who has questions. Excellent. Um, right, so does Excellent. anyone have any questions they'd like to ask right now? I can ask a, a quick short one. Uh, if you had a, a first year student just getting into to databases today, what would you tell them they should work on? Uh, a small problem. I'll, I would turn that question around, Joey. I'd point to the, I'd say, what exactly are you interested in? And pretty much anything they said, I could point to an aspect of this bigger picture I mentioned where there's tons of interesting questions to ask, right? Uh, you know, if you're interested in ML, well, here's an example I'll give you. Yeah, I mean, completely random guess, mind you. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, let's say you create a model using you know, your favorite uh, environment. Ultimately, let's say you deploy it in a mod gauge application and based on the model score, someone's mod gauge application is denied, mm -hmm. right? And the bank is sued. How do you have a way to explain why the model said what it did and whether or not there was implicit bias there. To do this, when you really deconstruct this, you need chain of custody of the data on which the model was trained down to the version, okay? All the way through the details of the parameters, the algorithms, the bozo who actually built the model, right? The date it was built. And then when it was deployed, into that mortgage application, by whom? And then 
when it was actually used to deny that mortgage, what data it was scoring, right? And you need this whole chain, boom, click a button, along with all the statistical analysis that indicates whether there was bias in the training data, whether there was bias inherent in the algorithm chosen, right? Uh, this is the That's kind a of big thing problem. Yes. <laughs> That's a big problem for a first year student. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's, it's so, Berkeley. It, you need to have yeah, higher standards than that. Yeah, we gave a problem like that to a first year student. Um, it's just that it, it's a hard thing to study. I was, I was wondering if there's like a smaller cut of these stories. We, we can do this offline. It, it, it's there's clearly so many big problems, but a lot of them they, they take a big organization. Perhaps, okay, let me to, give you a example. first year student problem then. Mm -hmm. There's all this buzz about fancy language models like GPT-4, okay? Training them is incredibly expensive, but fine. Let's say you train a model, you make it available. Scoring it ain't cheap either. So I give you a model, the first year student, and maybe there's still a challenging problem, figure out how to make that training as, I mean, that scoring as efficient as possible. And I won't even say make the scoring as efficient make something super efficient that is highly correlated to the output of this language model when it scores something. We're working Learn on that. Something so is good. That is, what's that? <laughs> We're working on this. You, you nailed the right problem there. Uh, okay. All right. Good, good, good. All right. Okay, I, okay. I, I, I'll bug you more about this later. Uh, others can. Love to hear that, Joey. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Any more questions? Don't be shy. Technical question, I guess, Raghu. So it seems like, you know, in the um, scheduling problem that you guys have framed around the multi-query scheduling and optimization, um, there's there's so much latitude in that design space. I mean, it's not possible to, to optimize in that space. It's clearly heuristic. And I wonder um, if you can say anything about the kinds of techniques you're throwing at that big problem you have there. Uh, to be completely candid with you, it's taken us all the cycles we have to come up with a clean foundation, a mechanism, the infrastructure, the framework. Our current policies are, as you said, heuristic at best. If I had one of your students, uh, unlike say Joey's, uh, this is a field of dreams if you want to go in there and poke around and do really impactful work, right? There's tons of interesting questions to explore. Sounds great. We are um, kind of at time. I have more questions that I've pushed on that thread, but, but um, probably another time. Guys, as always, a real pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us, Raghu. Yeah, thank you very thank much. You.